Hi, everybody. Wendy Sellers here, the HR lady. Welcome to our podcast today, which is five ways our employees drive us crazy and what to do about it. Before jumping into the topic at hand, our first topic, I wanted to go over some statistics. What are the costs of poor leadership? Most organizations are operating with a 5 to 10% productivity loss that better leadership practices could eliminate. And this is a statistic from the Ken Blanchard companies. The cost of poor leadership is loss of annual sales. The statistics show that there is a loss of 7% of total annual sales due to poor leadership. There's also a loss of 9 to 32% of voluntary turnover due to poor leadership. And then finally, there's a loss of 3 to 4% of customer satisfaction scores due to poor leadership. I actually think in 2022, that is probably much higher than when these surveys were actually taken because of what has been happening in our world. So better leadership can increase your sales. And if anything, that is what the C-suite should be worried about. Let's talk about another statistics before we jump into the topic at hand. This is from the Gallup State of the American Workforce Report, and they polled 1 million U.S. workers, and they concluded that the number one reason people quit their jobs is a bad boss or immediate supervisor. 50% of workers who voluntarily left their jobs did so because of their bosses and not the position itself, not the pay itself. In spite of how good a job may be, people will quit if the relationship with their manager is not healthy. So the bottom line is when you name the wrong person manager, nothing, and I mean nothing, fixes that bad decision. Not compensation, not benefits, nothing. So ask yourself while you're listening to me over the next few days, do you have a leader who needs to change? Is it you? Really think about that. Why don't people want to change? Why don't they want to look in the mirror and say, I need to change? Could it be they don't know that they are the problem? Could it be they don't know how to fix the problem? Might be that they're proud to admit, too proud to admit that they are the problem. And they actually may believe that they're just not good enough, but want to appear perfect, you know, winging it. So dear leader, you might be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. That's a note from your team and from the HR lady too. Let's get back on topic here and discuss five ways employees drive us absolutely crazy and what to do about it. The first way is that employees don't listen. They just don't listen to us. They don't follow directions. They never follow up on my requests. They forget information. Why is that? Maybe you're talking at them rather than with them. Perhaps you're giving them too much detail or not enough at all, or maybe you're using complicated terminology. We're human beings, not robots, so there's not one solution to the question, how do we get people to listen? We kick off this series today discussing communication strategies for managers. Half the battle of getting people to listen to us is learning how to communicate with them. Again, with them, not at them. I have this video that I do when I do some live speaking, and I I wish I could show it to you right now, but it's if you're ever at a roundabout, I'm in Florida, and we have these things called roundabouts on the road, and so you don't have to all stop at a four-way stop sign, and it's this big circle. Well, I I dare you to use your, you know, your Google Maps or Waze, whatever you're using when you're going through a series of roundabouts, because I did this test. And two roundabouts, literally within two blocks of each other, I got completely different directions to go straight. I thought about that. I'm like, is that what we're doing to our employees? We're giving one employee one set of directions or instructions, and then we're changing those instructions for another employee. Or we're doing it to the same person and we're giving them the completely different instructions, even though they mean the same thing. So make sure You know, next time you're on a road and you're at a roundabout, you listen to those instructions and hopefully you'll get a kick out of it after hearing me and say, you know what? She's absolutely right. Why are we making this so complicated? People process information differently. So you have to deliver it to their level, not to your level. We always make it about us and not about them. 
You know, so you should be saying things like, I want to make sure that we're on the same page because I'm not the best communicator. Can you explain to the team or to me what we just agreed upon? And make sure you don't make it sound like they're an idiot. Second, shut up and listen to them. Don't use sarcasm. Don't talk down to them. Remember that people process information differently. And so your instructions may be completely mind-boggling to them. It's your job to get them to listen. So how do you do that? I want to take you down a little path here about active listening. And communication starts with active listening. So again, that means you have to listen. Of course, they have to listen too. But if you're listening to them, they will eventually listen to you. However, unlike conversations with friends who just need a listening ear when they vent, Business communications require careful attention and crystal clear clarity. Consider how you interact with you, with others at work, even if they're not your employees, so that they can both listen and be heard. Listen, do not do all the talking, and then clarify and summarize. For some people who may be upset and they're coming into your office or your workspace, One of two things I find happens is they either have what I call a word vomit and everything comes out or they barely say anything, right? And then you have to drag it out of them. With either one of those situations, what I would do is grab a pen and paper and start jotting down notes. Now, you have to be careful with this because you want to make sure you're still listening. So if you're that type of person that can't type, take notes and listen at the same time, then do not take the notes. Make sure that you take them after the fact and you clarify by the end of that conversation. If you are a person who can multitask and can listen and take notes, make sure that you do take notes, but let the person know that I am listening to you. There's a lot in this conversation. I'm going to take down notes so that we can recapture this at the end of this conversation. I also like to put away my phone and close my laptop so that they know that I am truly focused on them. You know, but let's face it, sometimes when they're walking in your office, it's not the right time and you just need to tell them that. This is not the right time. I don't have time right now. I'm rushing off to a meeting. Can we readdress this in an hour? Don't kick the ball so far down the court, though, that you never address it with them. I want you to write down the word listen, L-I-S-T-E-N. And then we're going to make an analogy for each one of those letters. L is look interested. And like I said, this is very important to not be multitasking when somebody is talking to you, especially if they have a problem that they're hoping hoping that you're going to resolve, right? So look interested. Put away your phones, laptop. Make sure your concentration is on them. The I is inquire. Inquire with questions. Try not to make it always yes, no answers because if somebody is nervous of already speaking to you for whatever reason, you may not get the full details. So I like to ask more detailed questions that are not just going to be a yes, no answer. The S is stay on target. This is difficult when somebody may be upset because they may be bringing up things from two years ago. This is where you'll grab your pen and paper and say, okay, we're going to talk about this one problem right now and keep redirecting them back to that issue. The T is test for understanding. This is important if they are nervous, if they're a shy person, they may be losing the conversation altogether. If that's the case, you stop right there and you go backwards and start inquiring with questions again. The E in listen is evaluate the message. Now, this is hard if you're not in front of the person. It's not impossible, but it is hard. It's easier to see somebody's body language if you're in front of them or possibly maybe on a Zoom call. And so if it's something that is super serious, I would really ask you to make it as as in-person as possible or on the phone is the next best option. If you're doing text or email, you're not going to be able to evaluate their body language in that message. And then finally, the N in listen is neutralize your feelings. Just because you've had a bad experience with this particular person or employee in the past doesn't mean that they're coming to you with invalid information. So neutralizing your feelings and possibly your facial expressions is very important as well. There's a huge importance of understanding nonverbal communication skills. In fact, 55% of our communication is actually nonverbal. 55%, that's huge. Gestures, posture, facial expressions. Now we have this thing in our COVID era with face masks. And if people are wearing face masks, that may hinder your nonverbal communication skills. So just keep this in mind. 
vocal elements are also incredibly important. So 38% of our conversation skills are vocal elements. So, you know, the pitch, tone, rate, the rhythm of somebody's voice. The actual words that we are saying are only 7% of our communication skills. This is so important to know because, again, if you are mostly using text message, social media, email with your coworkers or your teammates, then you are missing all of these categories here. The communication pyramid is also very important to know. Uh, so we have these these uh, intimate communication, and that is face-to-face. That's the most intimate form of communication you can have. The next most intimate is video or video conference. And then it gets a little less intimate. Not that I want you to get intimate with your employees, but you know what I mean. We want to make sure that we talk to the other people that we work with as human beings. So the next best option would be phone conference. Uh, Once you get into, again, the instant messaging, text, social media, and then email, it's very, you know, non-human, and we start getting some conflict in there. We're going to talk about conflict in a future podcast series. I want you to also stop and think about the team that you're working with and how their personality styles, no, scratch that, how your personality style affects communication. You need to know your style, and we're going to go over that in a second. Then you need to maybe guess and learn the styles of others. You're not going to actually be able to truly learn it unless you do an actual assessment, but I'm going to give you some information today that may help you figure it out. Most importantly, you need to know your triggers and be prepared to handle them. Why? Because you have to remember it's not about you. It's about everyone else, especially if you're a leader. So I like using the DISC personality assessment. It's super simple and easy, and it's a derivative of Myers-Briggs. Let's dive into the personality style method called DISC. There are four main styles, D, I, S, and C. This is the method I prefer to use. It is what I'm certified in, and I just think it's super simple and a great way to say, hey, what is my style? And that, that means I now have to figure out what my coworker styles are too so that I can adjust my style, not expect them to adjust their style. So grab a pen and paper, draw a circle. At the top of the circle, write outgoing. At the bottom of the circle, write reserved. On the left-hand side of the circle, write tasks. And on the right-hand side of the circle, write people. And that's basically what these styles are focused on. So the D and the I are on the top. So the D is on the top left. And it's a super outgoing person who is task-oriented as a priority. On the top right of the circle is I. And that's a super outgoing person who is people-oriented. On the bottom right of the circle is the S. And that is somebody who is more reserved, but they are people-oriented as a priority. And then on the final corner, so to speak, of the circle is a C. They're on the bottom left. And they are reserved people who are very task-oriented. So figure out where you are in that. I mean, I truly think you should do an assessment. You can contact me. I can help you. There's a lot of people out there that can help you. This is a derivative, as I mentioned, of Myers-Briggs. So it is scientifically legit, but doing these have changed my entire world. If you are a deep personality style, and there's sub-styles in between all of them. So there's actually 16 styles, but there's D, D, I, D, C, for example. So there's three Ds. But if you're a D personality style, again, you're going to be outgoing and task oriented, but you're going to be very dominant. Your your focus is on results. You are a driver and you're usually competitive. If you are an I, an influential personality style, you're also going to be outgoing, but you're much more people oriented. Your focus is on inspiring people, being enthusiastic, and possibly persuading people to do things that you want them to do. If you are an S personality style, a stabilizing person. You are definitely people-oriented, but much more reserved. And your focus is on being amiable in groups, democratic, and you have a lot of patience. And then finally, if you are a C personality style, you are definitely conscientious and cautious. You're much more reserved in the top styles and you're task-oriented. These folks are very, very systematic and detail-oriented. There is a personality style for every role. You don't have to be a specific personality style to work in a role, but it tends to work out that way. 
If you're interested in knowing more about this, feel free to grab one of my books, Suck It Up Buttercup, and I explain it a lot more in there. In fact, for the D's and the C's, I actually have a free activity for you on my website. And why do I have it for the D's and the C's only? It's an activity to get the D's and the C's to be more people-oriented because the D's and the C's are naturally focused on tasks as a a priority. So I encourage you to download that and work on yourself. Remember, you could only change yourself, not anyone else. On the same topic of communication, let's talk about generations. There are a lot more myths than facts in the news about generations in the workplace. So generations is ages. And we're not really supposed to talk about ages at work, but we do. We do it anyways, and we we put people in these boxes because of their age or their generation. But what I have found out is that people are much more alike than different, regardless of their age. The world has changed. Basic needs and desires of employees have changed. So regardless of the age, the world has changed, and that's why generations are differently different. No one fits into a neat box, though, regarding personality styles, age, generations, ability, disability, degree, experience, etc. You have to make sure you take in everything with a grain of salt and treating people like an individual and not putting them in a box. As I mentioned, I said that I found out that more people are the same. Well, it's not just me. It's the scientists as well. Research by IBM measured generational differences in attitude toward three key workplace engagement drivers. And guess what? The results barely differed based on which generation answered this. And that was on future vision of the employee. And they want to know what the future vision of the employer is. Growth and development. Everybody wants it regardless of their age. And recognition. Everybody desires it. They might desire it differently, but they do desire it. So again, don't get so caught up in generations or age because there's a lot more things that are alike than are different. But I'm going to go over generations real quickly just so you understand if you hear these terminology out there. The first that we're going to talk about that's still in the workplace is baby boomers. And they were born 1946 to 1965. And the reason I say that age range is there's no scientific category that says you're a baby boomer. Here's the age that you are. Somebody made this up and we all ran with it. And so you might hear some of the actual dates vary a little bit. But the major characteristics of the majority of baby boomers, again, remember, everybody's different, is job loyalty, self-motivation, high work ethic being competitive, and willing to make personal sacrifices for professional successes. Again, take a lot of this with a grain of salt because every single human being is different. The biggest thing that any baby boomer right now is dealing with if they're still in the workplace is they may not have saved money for retirement or they may have lost it in one of the many crashes. Then there's Generation X. They're about 1965 to 1980. Their major characteristics of the group as a whole is being efficient, direct in their communication style. Remember, not all personalities are direct, so take that with a grain of salt. Adaptable to new technologies, independent, steady, and dependable. Let's focus on the independent for a second. Most, not most, but many Generation X as kids were latchkey kids. And so they had to get themselves off to school in the morning and back to school in the afternoon, do their homework, have dinner ready before mom or dad came home. Also, many Generation X may have be, may be in a single parent home. And so that was something that's very new. Now, the cool thing is, because I'm Generation X, so I think it's really cool, is being the latchkey kid gave us a lot of freedom. It also gave us a lot of flexibility to figure out how to do things absolutely last minute before mom and dad walked in. So You know, this is where the flexibility started coming in when we're hiring Gen X is they've already been dealing with it a lot of their life. And even if it wasn't a single parent home, it was definitely two parents in the workforce for most Generation X kids. Then we move on to the millennials. I always joke about the millennials when I'm talking to millennials. I'm like, don't worry, another generation's coming along soon and they're going to make fun of them. And we're here. We have Gen Z. So we'll talk about them in a minute. Millennials are about 1981 to 1996 is their birth years, and their major characteristics are being competitive, 
definitely tech savvy. They're in a tech savvy world. They can figure out most technology, maybe not behind the scenes, but they know how to use it. They're very achievement oriented. We made sure of that, right? And we made sure that we gave all these awards based on everything possible, including just showing up. It's not their fault. It was our fault that we did that to them. And then we're blaming it on them that they want an award for everything. They are very focused, though, on work-life balance. And here's an, a reason why. The millennials are the generation that got hit with every recession in the past 20 years, 30 years, really. They've got hit with everything possible, including 9-11, uh, COVID, the recession before 9-11. And so when they were coming out of college with these, you know, seven-year degrees because we made them go back to school a million times, there was no jobs for them. And then we wonder why they don't have the experience. Well, they don't have the experience because they piece together gig work and part-time jobs or just a job to make money. And so go easy on my millennials, okay? Get to know them as human beings and make sure that you're giving them unique work experience because they may need it and they're going to work very hard for you. And then finally, our current generation which I'm going to dive into a little bit more because not many people know too much about Gen Z and why would that we, some of them are still in elementary school. They are the first true tech natives. Uh, their generation started about 1997, depending on which re resource you're looking at, and they've never known the world without the internet. So how interesting is that? Their major characteristics of the ones that are in the workforce right now is that they are very diverse. They love diversity. They're open-minded and progressive. They think the rest of us are crazy not being open-minded and progressive. And they're right, by the way. They're very tech-savvy, individualistic, and creative, and they're self-directed. So a little bit more about Gen Z. There's a lot of myths out there. You know, hint, there's a lot of myths out there about every generation. Even the information that I gave you is, you know, it's just, again, I, I can't say it enough. Take it with a grain of salt because... It, it, a lot of this stuff is different based on somebody's maybe personality, what country they grew up in, you know, how they grew up, things like that. But one of the first myths about Gen Z, which is the incoming generation to the workforce, is that they only want to freelance and do gig work. And that's not the case. Of the people that are in the Gen Z generation and are in the workforce, only 4% of them are actually in freelance and gig economy. The, you know, a lot, a lot of people ask me why my answer and many people's answer is student loan debt. We made sure they went to school and then they got no jobs and everything crashed again. And so in order to be a freelancer, a gig economy as a full time position, that's probably not going to pay for their student loans. Now, many Gen Z may be also having part time or side gigs to be making extra money. The second myth about Gen Z is that they prefer only remote work environments, and that's absolutely not the case. That's not the case with anybody. You just have to ask your individual employees if they want to be working remotely, and maybe they only want to be working remotely two days a week. The thing with Gen Z is they actually do like human interaction and in-person collaboration, because and remote arrangements don't always provide that. They should. We're getting there, but they don't always provide that. The third myth that I want to talk about Gen Z is they don't want frequent feedback, and that's absolutely not the case. They don't want micromanagement, but they do want feedback. They want to make sure that they're independent and they're going in the right direction. So making sure that you are giving frequent feedback is very important. We're going to be talking about that in another session. And then the fourth myth is that Gen Z want to work alone, and that's not the case refer back to the personality styles. They may want to work alone. They may not. How are you going to know? Hey, how about ask them? It's pretty simple. And that goes for every generation. And then finally, the fifth myth about Gen Zs is to avoid in-person communications because they're so tech savvy that they'll just handle text messages or emails instead of an in-person communication. And that's not the case at all. They actually want the face-to-face -face, and maybe a remote face-to-face so that may they make sure that the message that you're trying to convey is actually the message that they're receiving. So I encourage you to be open-minded about all the generations and make sure that you understand that everybody's an individual and their personality style styles matter, their generations matter, their education matters, their work experience, working somewhere else matters. Labels might help, but they actually can harm people. 
Uh, we're all judgmental. It's it natural, but check your judgment and ask, why do I feel this way about X person? Your action plan should be thinking about what we just discussed and writing down what skills do I need to focus on developing first? What skill or activity will you practice over the next 30 days? And are you going to trust somebody to hold you accountable to practice that? Our next session is going to be about the second why people drive us crazy at work. They make so many mistakes. I have two books, which you can find on Amazon or on thehrlady.com. Wendy Sellers here, the HR lady. Welcome back to five ways employees drive us crazy and what to do about it. The second topic we're going to discuss is they make so many mistakes. Well, here's a hint. Osmosis and mind reading is not a thing with human beings. We're going to dive into providing feedback as well as training and development methods in order to remove as many mistakes as possible from your workplace. But first, you have to leave that judgment. It's your job to get them to do things right. But how do you do that? Put it in writing. Give them deadlines. Mutually agreed upon deadlines would be the preference. And then follow up. More on that in a minute. So how do you get them to do their job right? I like to start with three simple questions. I call them the three W's. Who, what, and when. Who specifically needs to do the task? what specifically needs to be done, and when specifically does this need to be done by. This is very important when you're talking in groups, because if you're talking to two, three people, all those other people are going to go, oh, my coworkers got it. And then they're going, no, my coworkers got it. Oh, no, my other coworkers got it. So you have to be very, very specific on the who, the what, and the when. Three W's, keep that in mind. Your team is only as good as your aka managers, follow-up skills. Write things down, schedule ongoing meetings with your team members, follow up on your mutual agreements, observe any signs of growth, progress in the task or with the person, check in, make sure that you have an open door. Even if you don't have a door, make sure people know that you have an open door and that they can stop by and ask questions at any time. Communicate the impact of the three W's. Watch for changes in your relationships. If people are starting to avoid you or avoid eye contact, something might be going on. And then grab that mirror and evaluate yourself. Remember, you might be part of the problem. I want to go over a few statistics here about retention. I love using Gallup. They do all the research for you, and then you can just go ahead and look at their stats and say, where is my company? So per Gallup, at least 75% of the reasons for very costly voluntary turnover, so when people quit, come down to things that the manager can influence. Managers who can't or won't do anything about these factors that drive turnover can expect to be filling job requisitions soon. And let's talk about that. Maybe not even filling them, just putting job ads out there, but we have a staffing shortage in the United States. So you're going to have a shortage for quite some time in your organization. So why do employees leave voluntarily? The number one reason per Gallup, and let me just stop right there and tell you, this was pre-pandemic that this survey was done. So it might possibly be different right now. But the number one reason was not actually paying benefits. It was career advancement or promotional opportunities. 32% of people who quit their job was because of career advancement or promotional opportunities. That's something that you, a manager, can affect. 22% quit because of pay and benefits. That's also something that you, a manager, can affect. Now, maybe you can't change your benefits. Maybe you can't change the pay, but you can definitely go to bat for them and say, I want to give them a promotion so that they can get to the next pay grade. Other reasons are lack of fit to a job. 20% of employees who quit said, I didn't even fit that job. Whose fault is that? That's the hiring manager's fault. Why did you hire them into that position if they didn't fit that job? And I know some of you might be saying, because there's a staff shortage and we're desperate and I get it, but they're just going to leave. And when they leave, they're taking that 
time and talent with them. And it's costly, very, very costly. 17% said the reason they quit their job was specifically because of managers or the general work environment. So the manager themselves. And then other reasons are flexibility, scheduling, and then job security. So keep these things in mind. Don't say, I can't affect that because you possibly can by going to bat for your employees. Let's talk about even more items, feedback and accountability. Accountable people seek feedback. And interesting enough, feedback creates accountable people. Isn't that interesting? So I don't have time is no longer an excuse to say I don't have time to meet with that employee and talk to them about X, Y, Z. You need to make sure that they trust you. Trust and doubt is huge and a huge reason why people leave or worse, I call it quit and stay. They quit giving you the bare minimum so they don't get fired and they could still take that paycheck home and they're there, but they've kind of checked out. The shadow of doubt lingers over every decision to trust you, but you can do a lot to reduce that doubt. What can you do? Transparency is super important. Now, let's face it, that's to a degree, right? You can't tell all your employees everything that's going on, especially with their coworkers, because that's confidential information and you want that coworker to trust you. So transparency to a degree is very important. Tell them what you can tell them of what's going on, even when things aren't going great. Let them know. Otherwise, they make things up in their head and rumors go around. What else can you do to reduce doubt is respect. Respect people and they will respect you. Respect is earned, right? But guess what? It's even earned for leaders. Just because you have a title behind your name doesn't mean people are going to automatically respect you. And then feedback. Feedback, feedback, feedback is so important. So let's talk about feedback a little bit more. Feedback isn't about surprising somebody. The sooner you provide feedback, the more the person will understand the issue of concern. And be very specific when you're giving feedback. Tell the person exactly what you need them to improve or continue doing. This ensures that you stick to the facts and there's less room for ambiguity and confusion. Training is for the current job. Development is for the future job. Why do you want to develop them for a future job? For retention. That's why. When is training needed? Training is needed throughout the entire employee life cycle. Of course, it's needed for new hires. I don't care if the new hire that you just brought in has 25 years experience doing exactly what you do. It was at a different company. They need training for your software, for your rules, your processes, your procedures. So training is for the current job. When is it needed though? It's needed from everything from new hires to promotions. Obviously, new hires are new to the company. They don't know anything about even where the restroom is how to do timesheets or the technology possibly that you're using at your company. Sure, you may have hired them because they have the skills, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that you need, and they got that somewhere else, but everything at your company is going to be unique. So you need to take the time to train new hires. When you're just throwing them into the role, you're throwing them into a setup for failure. So make sure you have a plan, 30, 60, 90 day plan for training new hires. This is the same thing for anybody who's new in a role. Even if they're promoted internally, there should be a plan, minimum of 30 days, possibly 90 days. For some roles, that takes a lot longer. It might be up to a year. If you're changing any software in your organization make or any other kind of technology, make sure you plan on training all your people on that. Development, though, like I mentioned, is for a future role. And while we hate to give people a future role opportunity, because that means we lose them maybe to a different department, or we now have to backfill them, at least we don't lose all of their knowledge, skills, and abilities that they learned at your organization. They're still there, just in a different role. If employees say, I want to be in a different role, I know it's difficult to hear, but start planning to develop them for that role. Otherwise, another company will do so. Make sure your employees aren't stagnant. Because many people will leave, like I said, in that Gallup poll because they want a new career opportunity. They want growth. Okay, so let's talk about development for a future role. Now, hopefully this future role is in your organization. But even if it's not, if you're developing somebody for a future role and they end up taking that somewhere else, they're going to give you amazing reviews and maybe they'll send their friends to fill the role that they're leaving. 
but ideally we would like to develop people for our organization, right? Make sure you're asking your employees during these regular feedback sessions, hey, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to do next year? What about in three years? What about in five years? If you ask, they just might tell you, and then you could help develop them and stay at your company longer instead of being stagnant and bored and then they leave. Remember that Gallup poll said most people leave because there's no career development opportunities in their current company. Create a plan with your employees, your individual employees, so that your training development is calendar driven. Why? We get busy and we forget about this. And then our employees walk out the door. Make sure that you are creating that plan so that you're boosting their confidence. They don't have doubt in you. They trust you and they want to work for you, work with you, and they're going to stay when times get tough. Let's talk a little bit about performance reviews. Ugh. Does the mere mention of a performance review make your heart sink? It does for mine. And I'm the HR lady. We save up our comments and our documents all year long of this person did something good, this person did something bad. And that's just a shame because giving and receiving feedback is key to engaging your employees every single day and keeping them on track. There has been a major shift in approach for performance reviews. I just call them feedback sessions because it should be both performance and behavior feedback. In the past, there was annual feedback and now there's ongoing conversations. Believe it or not, I'm probably one of the few HR people that can't stand the annual review. I like them to go away completely. Now, some of you need to have them for some compliance reasons. Contracts require them. Maybe you're working with the government and that contract requires them. That's okay, but that doesn't mean you can't have ongoing conversations, frequent conversations throughout the year. Listen, annual reviews are too late. They're often a monologue, not a dialogue. They're very formal. They stifle conversation. They're rushed. Then there's information in there that the employee doesn't even know about because you've been saving information all year long and you never talk to them about it. And the once a year review is rarely followed up with actual appropriate action. And it's very stressful for everyone involved. No one should be surprised at the content of an annual review. So let's move these performance and behavior conversations to more frequently. Let's start with 15-minute conversations once a month with each individual employee. Now, some of you might be gasping because it's timely and it's time-consuming. But you know what? If that employee finds out something in that 15-minute monthly conversation that they can fix, it'll be fixed right then and there, not 11 months down the road. If starting out monthly is too much for you, just start out quarterly and then go bi-monthly and then monthly. But I guarantee you, it gets easier. The first conversation might be awkward because the employee is going, why is this person talking to me? And it's not my annual review period. They're either going to give you all this information and it's going to be a two-hour session or they're going to clam up and say nothing. And then the second conversation will get easier because you're going to put it on their calendar and they're going to expect it. So you put recurring meetings on everybody's calendar, including yours, every quarter, lists are small, or every month then they're going to know that they have a lot of time with you. Again, it just needs to be 15 minutes to have a conversation about what's going well, what's not going well. And of course, if there is something super serious, especially if it's something negative, you want to address that sooner than later. You don't even want to wait for that 15-minute conversation. When you're having these 15-minute conversations, you know, don't make it so formal that it's scary, but do take notes. Your note could be an email follow-up. Guess what? That's documentation. That counts as documentation. And then when you're saving all that documentation for your forced annual review, you all have it already. You're both on the same page. For some of you that don't have email in the workplace, maybe you're in manufacturing or construction and and you don't use email with your employees, that's okay. You can send the email to yourself, print it out, and hand it to them. So now they have the documentation. If you're wondering, what do I talk about in these 15-minute conversations, you could literally ask these three questions. What's going well? What's not going well? What can I help you with? And then shut up and listen. The case for change is now. Feedback is often incredibly unreliable, especially when it's those fancy performance review forms that I personally do not like. Why? Because ratings are often a reflection of the reviewer. 
and we don't always ask the employee to do a self rating. So if you are going to continue doing a rating form, please get your employees involved in rating themselves as well. And here's a scary thought, maybe even rating you. Ooh, make sure though that you understand your rating system and there should be definitions of what the ratings are. Generally speaking though, the goals of feedback, there's three of them. It's so that you can tell your employee, I see your good or bad performance and behavior. I want to fuel your performance and behavior. And I want to reward your performance and behavior. So three things, see, fuel, and reward. That is the purpose of feedback. There is a feedback fallacy though. So if your people ignore you when you're talking to them, hmm, that probably means that you are criticizing them too much. The human brain scientifically responds to critical feedback as a threat and it shuts down. So they're not intentionally ignoring you. Okay, some of them might be, but they're not intentionally ignoring you. If you are a threat to them all the time, their brain says, do not listen to this person. So focusing only on people's shortcomings or gaps, it actually doesn't enable their learning. It impairs it. Who would have thunk? Criticism assumes your way is better and inhibits their brain from listening because their brain is not listening to you at all. So look into that. I write about that in my in my book, and there's a lot of articles on it. There's a great article with the Harvard Business Review called Nine Lies About Work and the Feedback Fallacy, and I think it's just fascinating to hear that information. So focusing on positive outcomes is really what you should be doing. I like giving the example of speaking French. So you've got a French client, and all your employees speak English and Spanish. And you're like, oh, by the way, tomorrow I need you to speak French because we got a French client. No matter how much you threaten them, no matter how much you criticize them, they're not going to come to work tomorrow and speak French. And so what you should have done was hired a French speaking employee or thought about that getting that contract before you got that contract on your books. So Interesting way to look at it is, again, if you're criticizing people, it's not going to change their learning. Be cognizant, again, of your ratings and what you believe your rating system actually means. And then be cognizant of your perceptions and your judgments. Again, we all like to judge a little bit, but realize that everyone makes mistakes. It's how we learn. So when you're saying your employees driving you crazy because they make so many mistakes, you're probably part of the problem. But it is how we learn is how to make mistakes. Ask yourself, is this person a continuous problem? Or is it just your perception? Because for some reason, you don't get along with them. Grab that mirror. Is this person too valuable to discipline? Hint, no one is. And when you say that someone is too valuable to discipline, maybe they're the only one that has a license that you need or a certification or a certain skill, All your other employees see that and they know that and they check out either figuratively or literally by resigning. So your action plan from today should be asking yourself, what skills do I need to focus on developing first with myself? What skill or activity are you going to practice over the next 30 days? And who do you trust to encourage you to do this and hold you accountable? In our next session, we're going to be talking about our employees have no common sense. I have two books, which you can find on Amazon or on thehrlady.com. Wendy Sellers here, The HR Lady. Welcome back to Five Ways Employees Drive Us Crazy and What to Do About It. Today, we're going to be focusing on common sense. Employees have no common sense. I'm sure you've said that a million times. I know some of you are chuckling right now. Hopefully after today, you won't be saying that anymore. Why? Because expecting miracles and the acquisition of skills or information via osmosis is completely ridiculous. We're going to review aligning individual candidates and employees into the right job, your emotional intelligence, and the skill of coaching. Listen, it's your job to get employees to obtain common sense. How do you do that? Training, training and development, as we discussed, could be on the job training, classrooms training, video training, whatever format you have. 
You have to train and develop your employees, no matter how many years of experience they have. Let me ask you a few questions. Do you have job descriptions? Are they current or they have not been updated since 1980? Do your current employees meet all of the knowledge, skills, and abilities that are listed in those job descriptions? If not, why are you mad at the employees for not having the knowledge, skills, and abilities? Why did you hire them? Why did you put them in that position and then get mad at them? Get them the training and development in order to get the knowledge, skills, and abilities for their their updated job description change the job and the job description itself, or move them out of that job. Ta-da! Magically fixed. Not really when we're having a skill shortage, right? But that is the gist of what you need to do. We create these job descriptions and then we never look at them again. We should be using them for performance reviews and making sure that everybody is aligned with the job description that they were hired to do. Let me ask you a few more questions. Have you ever asked yourself, what were they thinking? Why did they do that? Why do I have to explain this one more time? Isn't it just common sense to X, Y, Z? Well, common sense defined means it's actually not a sense. We're not born with it. It is really a set of skills that are learned over time. And then repeatedly practice in order to become automatic actions and habits. I've renamed common sense emotional intelligence. What is emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence is your ability to recognize and understand emotions in yourself and then in others. And your ability to use this awareness to manage your own behavior and relationships. It's pretty amazing. Emotional intelligence is not innate. Again, you're not born with it. It is something that is learned. It is not a personality trait. It is very dynamic and fluid. It is not information or data. It's about emotions and relationships. It is not IQ. It is known as EI or EQ. It is based on personal and social growth. Now, let's get to a little bit of the science behind emotional intelligence. We have an emotional reaction to events before our rational mind is able to engage. So information goes into the spinal cord and then into the limbic system, which says, I feel something. And then it goes over to the rational part of the brain way over here. So you feel something wait a second, wait a second. Okay, here comes the rational part. You have to train your brain to do that. You have to train your brain to form these habits and use common sense. Emotions run the show. So back to the brain part again, the emotional relational side of your brain operates faster, actually six cycles faster than the logical side of your brain. So that taking a deep breath is super important when something emotional has happened, so you can say, okay, the logical side of my brain is now catching up. It's very important. When people say, take a deep breath, it's not just because they want a moment to gather their thoughts. It's so your emotions will calm down and your rational brain will kick in. I uh, share this image on LinkedIn often. I actually got it from, from LinkedIn from Dr. Travis Bradbury. And he wrote an article and it's why leaders lack emotional intelligence. And there's this actual graph chart and it shows everything from an individual contributor all the way to a CEO. So there's an individual contributor, supervisor, manager, uh, director up to a CEO. And it shows that people that are in the supervisory role and the manager role actually have the highest level of emotional intelligence way more than most people that are directors, executives, VPs, executives, and even CEOs. Why do you think that is? It's because they're dealing with employees' emotions all the time, where CEOs may not be. They may only be dealing with it once in a while because that is not their day-to-day focus. So if you're listening to this today and you are not a hands-on supervisor or manager, you don't have employees directly working under you, 
I encourage you to walk around the room. So that walk around by management, it really does mean something because you're going to get in touch with the emotions of other people and your emotional intelligence will go up, but you have to practice it. There are five attributes of emotional intelligence. Now, this depends on on what model you look at. There's a couple different models out there. It's not exactly a science. Uh, The model that I look at, there's five attributes, self-awareness, self-regulation, self-motivation, empathy, and social skills or relationships. In another model, empathy is just in one of those. So they're all covered. But you can see there's basically a personal confidence and then there's a social confidence. So the first three are about me, my self-awareness, my self-regulation, and my self-motivation. And then the other attributes are more of a social competence, so relationships with other people. Empathy is a huge one. Empathy is not sympathy. Empathy is the ability to put yourself, figuratively speaking, in someone's shoes, even if you have never would ever be in their shoes. But if I was in their shoes, how would I feel? And then, of course, social skills and relationships. Remember, emotional intelligence is not something that you're born with. So everybody does have to learn this. And it could be something that's aligned with your personality, because if your personality is you are super focused on people and their feelings, you are probably naturally going to have better relationship skills. So a lot of these things go together. Remember to not judge somebody based on their age or personality or even their emotional intelligence, people are capable of learning. You just have to show them the way. What are some of the EI, or it's also known as EQ, strategies to help embrace your resistance to change and, oh, I don't know, communication mishaps? One is to identify the source of your resistance. Why are you resistant to this change, or why don't you want to talk to this person? Second, question the basis of your emotional response. Remember, your emotions come first. Try to put in that rational part of like, okay, why don't I want to deal with this person or this topic? Could be that they remind you of somebody else. It could be that your last experience with them was was unpleasant. A lot of these are very common, but as a manager or supervisor, we have to get over that because we can't just shun somebody. They will leave and or you may get sued. Number three is own your own part in the situation. Remember, grab that mirror and say, how am I part of the problem here? And then finally, turn up your positive outlook. You know, we can make ourselves become positive. For some of you, it might just be, you know, looking through some cat or dog pictures, going for a brisk walk, taking a break, uh, whatever it might be, but turn up your positive outlook and get yourself in a good mood so that you can deal with with these emotional responses and turn them into rational responses. Let's talk a little bit about coaching because every manager needs to practice two types of coaching. One is calendar driven and then one is event driven. And what do they mean? So calendar driven is what I discussed in our last session where you're going to put recurring appointments on your calendar and force yourself to communicate with your employees, but not about the daily tasks, but about them. How are things going? Where do they want to be in the future? How can you help them? So they're they're usually more formal, but you can do things on your own calendar that aren't an appointment with somebody else to just remind you to get up and walk around and talk to people. Another item would be something that's event-driven. And unfortunately, the event-driven items are usually what takes over our life because they're they're happening right there. Something bad's happening typically. Hopefully something's good happening, but it's usually where there's a blow up or there's an interaction that was inappropriate and you need to get involved. Work projects not getting done, a task isn't getting done, and that's an event. And so we drop everything and we address that event. Try not to let the events take over the calendar driven. It's going to happen that you're going to have to cancel a meeting once in a while. Please make sure you reschedule it. Make sure that you are figuring out what type of coaching you do best in, the event-driven or the calendar-driven, and lean towards that. Remember, we can't all be everything to everybody, but maybe one of your coworkers who's also a manager can help you out with that. After any one of these meetings, whether it's a calendar meeting, event meeting, good, bad, positive, negative, talk to the person that you're working with, whether it's an employee or a coworker, and say, how do you think that meeting went? So that you can have some open conversations. 
What was your reaction to so-and-so's recommendation? Again, so you can get this two-way feedback and let people know that they're part of a team. Could be what part of the project or the presentation do you think went best? These are very quick conversations, but they may mean the world to somebody. Remember what we talked about in a previous podcast is your feedback skills have to be on point. Feedback is so, so important. Now, there's a difference between coaching and supervision. To be a supervisor, you're supposed to coach, but in coaching, you're not always a supervisor at that moment. Sometimes you're just helping somebody because you care about them as a human being, even if you're not their supervisor. But coaching is another opportunity to grow and develop. Coaching can take place in many formats, teaching, advising, counseling, modeling the way, helping them with problem solving, where supervision is usually more about planning, directing, organizing, and controlling workflows and people. Many of your employees, though, like to be coached differently than maybe their coworker. Some people like to be advised and taught. Others want to just be listened to and ask questions and get the answers that they're seeking. Some want to be flat out told what to do, and others want to figure it out for themselves. Remember, when you're meeting with them on a quarterly, hopefully bi-monthly or monthly basis at this point, you're going to get to know them as individuals and figure this out. But just ask them how they want to be coached. Effective coaches know how to adapt their coaching style to the preferences of their coachee. And they also know how to change the processes. Finally, when you're dealing with individuals in the workplace and they're driving you crazy, find the root cause of what is driving you crazy. I like to take the person out of it, even though the person's always going to be involved, but maybe it's equipment that's that's uh, faltering. Maybe the process is broken and we've been using it for 15 years. Maybe we don't have enough materials. Maybe it's the environment. Hey, maybe I need to grab a mirror and it's me, the manager. But finding the root cause of the problem is very important because it points to what needs to be corrected rather than blaming somebody. It creates a trusting culture open to change rather than that culture of fear. It prevents small issues from escalating into big conflicts or being hidden. It allows for a review of the system, the processes, and it humanizes the monster. You can take down the guard of the employee so they can tell you what's going on. Your action plan moving forward today should be, what skills do I need to focus on developing first? What skill or activity will I practice over the next 30 days? And who do I trust on my team to encourage me and hold me accountable to practicing these skills? Our next podcast on five ways employees drive us crazy is going to be about their entitlement mentality. Wendy Sellers here, the HR lady. Welcome back to five ways employees drive us crazy and what to do about it. They have entitlement mentality, do they? That's what we're going to discuss today. Listen, a safe workplace, decent wages, and mutual respect is not entitlement. In this session today, we're going to talk about setting boundaries as well as healthy and unhealthy conflict. As I've mentioned a gazillion times already, we are a lot more alike than we are different. Focus on adapting your communication styles. So you, the manager, need to change your style. Less memos, emails, and text messages, more in-person, two-way conversations. Whether the individual is 20 or 60, male or female, white, brown, yellow, black, it doesn't matter. Everybody should be treated as an individual. If you know them as a person, as a human being, you can adapt your communication. However, if their knowledge, skills, and abilities do not fit the job or the project, they're not going to work out, end of story, and it's not their fault. With that said, if you hired or promoted the wrong person and have yet to hold them accountable or get rid of them, then yes, they probably do feel entitled because they have no idea that anything is wrong. It's your job, again, to set boundaries. How do you do that? Focus on those knowledge, skills, and abilities, two-way communication, and accountability. 
let's dive into conflict because honestly, it's all really about perspective. Perspective is the reality. Emotional and behavioral awareness is key to managing and appropriately responding to behavior to get to the root cause of issues. What is conflict? Well, the definition of conflict is a form of communication that has a disagreement. It's really not that scary, and there can be healthy conflict. Bottom line, whether it's healthy or unhealthy, conflict in the workplace is inevitable. You put two humans in a room, I don't care how much they like each other, there's going to be some kind of conflict. So how do we manage it at work? Well, first of all, keep in mind that it may be impacted by relationships and things like personality styles, generations, and even emotional intelligence. Conflict in the workplace requires effective communication skills by yours truly to address and resolve this conflict and to make sure everybody has a feeling of safety so that they can work through the conflict. Unhealthy conflict fosters negative feelings and a boatload of stress. It also creates barriers to communication and minimizes cooperation. Why? Because people are hiding from you, so they can't cooperate with you. It promotes negative behavior if left undressed, and it takes up a lot of expensive, valuable time. So how do we respond to conflict? Well, let's not do these things. Let's not avoid it because the problem will not go away. When we avoid people or things, we're thinking, oh, the problem's going to go away. Tell me a time when that actually worked because it rarely, if ever, does. Another tactic that your employees might have is, oh, poor me, and they complain to others. So it's called drama, and it gets everybody riled up. It's usually by a passive-aggressive person or someone who thinks they're a martyr. A very unhealthy response to conflict could be anger, which results in emotional outbursts. And that makes everybody uncomfortable and nothing is resolved. Everybody now avoids that person or they get angry and have emotional outbursts as well. And then another final unhealthy response to conflict, which is so immature, is revenge. A person may want to get even or even sabotage their coworker for ruining their reputation. It's your job, unfortunately, sorry, as the manager, the supervisor, or HR to deal with conflict in a healthy manner. If you are allowing employees or managers to deal with it in one of these manners that I just discussed, you're going to have a very bad impact on your culture. People might be explosive, angry, hurt, and resentful. They are most likely going to withdraw their trust in you and their respect in you. This is going to result possibly in a fear of abandonment that the employee feels that you abandoned them. And then what happens? They leave or worse, they quit and stay. They may also always expect a bad outcome when they're dealing with you. So you have to learn how to deal with conflict in a healthy manner. Why do we want to deal with it in a healthy manner? Well, obviously, we want to avoid all the things I just said, but we really want to expose those problems, you know, get to the root cause of the problems, take away the finger pointing and the blame and solve the problem. In some cases, the problem might be the person. And that's where coaching comes in and unfortunately, other items up to and including termination. We want to make sure that we motivate everybody to seek understanding of each other and improve the team dynamics, create a safe working environment. This may result, hopefully it will result, in better decisions by getting people to challenge their assumptions. It could also facilitate change, well-needed change. And it is a huge investment in time, though. And I think that is why a lot of people just avoid conflict altogether because they don't have the time. Well, if you avoid it, it stays there and you're going to be paying for it one way or the other. Make sure that when you're dealing with conflict, you recognize and respond to important matters. So maybe you don't have the time to do it right now, but put a calendar driven appointment on your calendar for tomorrow at 9 a.m. So that employee or set of employees is meeting with you and they know you're not ignoring them. You also need to make sure that everybody is ready to forgive and move on. This isn't so easy for everybody. But if you're giving everybody a fair shake, it's inevitable that someone's going to make a mistake. 
And you could also remind an employee who's not ready to forgive, hey, remember a time when you made a mistake and we all moved on? Just do that in private. You also want to make sure that everybody believes that they can have a resolution. Everybody's not always going to enjoy the resolution, but if once in a while they get their way, and I mean that in a positive way, that everyone gets a voice at the table and they say, okay, my voice is heard, but we're not choosing my resolution this time, but we have last time, so I'm comfortable with this decision. It's all about team dynamics. Just remember that conflict is not a negative word. It can be healthy. It's often uncomfortable, but it's necessary. There have been many conflicts in our workplace and our world throughout time, just recently, than there still is during the COVID era. But one of the things that I like to remind people of, because it's just kind of part of a workplace now, is OSHA, so safety at work. We didn't have safety at work or an Occupational Safety and Health Administration until 1970. And the reason we had that was because of conflict and people fought that battle for us. And now it's just part of what we do. We want to make sure our employees are safe at work. It's their right. So conflict can be a healthy thing. It can lead to long-term change, not only in your workplace, but in the entire world, to be quite honest. What are the five benefits of healthy team conflict? We want to make sure people feel that they can trust you and they're secure with you, but then they can trust their team so that they can talk openly about things that they agree and disagree with. Definitely invites diverse points of view. And I mean diversity in the legal sense and diversity in the in the sense of just asking people who normally wouldn't be invited to the table, what are your thoughts? And then allowing that conflict. Now, you may have to moderate that conflict and you know moderate who's speaking and when so that everybody has a voice at the table, but it gets easier. Healthy conflict surfaces potential issues. They don't get shoved under the rug and hidden. It also builds commitment to moving forward to the company vision, to the team, and it leads to better decisions overall. Some of the possible conflict outcomes are many. And again, not everyone's going to have a win-win. Some people might have a lose-lose, but if there's a compromise involved, or maybe a win-lose, one person's winning, one person's losing, but it's not always that same person that's winning and it's not always that same person that's losing, it gets a lot easier. But you're going to have to regulate that until the employees can figure out how to do it themselves. And sometimes that may be never. So be a conflict champion. It's okay. It's uncomfortable, but it is okay. Okay, so let's talk about common types of conflict and who is the person that is in charge of this conflict because it can be confusing and it may be different for your organization, but this is generally what I see. So the first one is the direct management. So leaders, supervisors, team leads, maybe directors, they typically deal with the day-to-day conflict amongst employees and the team, personality conflicts, gossip and drama, um, any kind of perceived unfairness. Constructive feedback, of course, because you're going to be having regular feedback conversations with your employees, and then process improvement ideas. They're usually dealt with at the team level. The next level up, so in your organization, it might be a director, maybe it's a VP, depends on how your organization is structured. But the next level up usually deals with, in conjunction with the manager, career path decisions for employees, uh, performance and behavior assessments finalizing them, making sure everything looks legit and is consistent with the company processes and the company procedures. Division of work might be at that level or it could be at the the management level as well. Major disciplinary issues and then even pay such as salary and promotions. Human resources usually deals with the legal issues. So harassment, discrimination, any kind of leave, federal leave, FMLA, employee health and benefits, and then any other kind of legal issues. Sure, is HR involved in some of these other items? Often because they're training or they might be the witness, but the managers and the supervisors and the directors are really the ones that should be handling the conflict, not HR. You may be leaning on HR for advice and guidance, especially for your company procedures, but you should be handling the majority of the conflict, not HR. 
here's what I ask people when they they come to me. A manager comes to me and says, hey, Wendy, can you go and talk to my employee for me based on his drama or perceived unfairness? And I say, do you want them to respect me or do you want them to respect you? Because if you want them to respect me, I'll go talk to them. If you want them to respect you, you should go talk to them. And we can practice that session before you go. Now, in some situations, you do know that you need a a witness because it might be a a borderline legal issue. And so grab another supervisor or maybe HR if another supervisor is not available. One item that I get a lot of calls on, and believe it or not, I, I would say a majority of my phone calls start with this, and it's rudeness and incivility at work. Rudeness leads to conflict, and you need to manage it. You need to deal with it. 50% of workers say that they have experienced rudeness or incivility at least once per week in the workplace. That's a lot. What's the cost to the company? Low morale, low productivity, and high turnover. So make sure that you're stepping on that rudeness and civility and you're pulling those people aside immediately and saying this is not acceptable here. Talking about low morale and poor productivity, which may be caused by rudeness, it may be caused by poor management, it may be caused uh, by other issues. So let's talk about the cost of low morale and poor productivity because of rudeness and incivility at work. In the survey that I mentioned, 80% of the people said they lost work time worrying about the rudeness incident. 63% lost work time avoiding the offender altogether. 66% said that their performance completely declined, and 78%, this is huge, 78% said their commitment to the company as a whole declined. 25% even admitted to taking it out on customers. Wow. Rudeness in the workplace is a top reason for employee resignation. One out of eight people who have been affected by rudeness based on their coworker or manager have left their organization voluntarily. It's a pretty big deal. So we need to kick this rudeness to the curb and make sure that everybody is behaving how we want them to behave at work. How do you do that? Be transparent about your expectations by creating, communicating, and enforcing your policies regarding any kind of behavior in the workplace. Ask questions about behavior in interviews using your company values. Provide education and training on the company values and the expected behavior in the workplace. And then hold people accountable, including yourself. Hold yourself accountable. Grab that mirror on your own behavior. And then finally, be inclusive to everybody on the team. So your action plan moving forward today is to ask yourself, what skills do I need to focus on developing first for me? What skill will I practice over the next 30 days? And who do I trust to hold me accountable for this? Our next and final session of five ways employees drive us crazy and what to do about it is about they just don't care. Wendy Sellers here, the HR lady. Welcome back to five ways employees drive us crazy and what to do about it. Our fifth way is they just don't care. Do you really think that's the case? Would you care about someone or a company that did not care about you? Probably not. The days of just do what I say or you won't have a job are long gone and good riddance. People at all levels of the org chart expect more from their employers, including standing up for them. It's your job to get them to care. How do you do that? You treat them like humans. You are transparent with them. You are honest with them and you provide them a boatload of feedback. According to a survey of 23,000 employees conducted by Harris Interactive, only 37% of employees actually understood what their employer was trying to achieve. That just blows my mind. Literally sitting in an interview Nobody explains to the candidate or the employee, for that matter, what the company vision is, what the mission is, or what the company values are. And then we are confused why the employee doesn't know this. You should lead using not only your vision and your mission for the organization, but also the company values. 
I know I've mentioned the values quite a few times already. These are super important to be able to control people's behavior. We often think of vision, mission, and values as a marketing tool for customers, and we forget about this very important aspect of our organization called the employees. If your values have words like realistic, honest, and reliable, by the way, they're my company values, maybe even respect and transparency. You can use that terminology when you're hiring, all the way through promotions, those regular feedback sessions, counseling and discipline when necessary, and unfortunately, also with terminations. Remember in our session that I said, I don't like performance reviews? It's because we forget about the behaviors. And nine times out of 10, people are calling me because somebody is behaving badly, not because they're performing badly. Performance is pretty easy to identify. Behavior is sometimes leaving us scratching our heads of what is acceptable at work and what is not. We need to make sure we have these company values. Furthermore, there's these two words that fit every budget. Thank you. It's completely free. Employees want, no scratch that, they demand appreciation and recognition from their managers and from the company as a whole. Now, don't go around just saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. You need to be very specific. You need to be saying, Joe, thank you for a job well done. The way you went above and beyond for XYZ customer on this date really meant a lot. I appreciate it. Very specific, fits every budget. Now, let's talk about bad attitudes. We talked about rudeness and civil incivility, but just general bad attitudes. If you are not addressing this at work, trust me. Everybody knows. All the coworkers know. They know somebody has a bad attitude and they're getting away with it. And then they think, well, if they're getting away with it, I'm going to get away with it too. And then they do. So the tools to handle a bad attitude are as follows. Number one, be swift. Do not delay. If you see it or you hear about it, act on it immediately. And be straightforward. Call the person out on it once you've confirmed that it actually is factual. You can say something like, what you're doing is negative and unproductive. And what I need is exceptional quality among team members who value other team members. And then be very specific. Talk about the incident. Say something like, part of what we need in this role is someone with a can-do attitude, as well as a willingness to hear feedback. This means I need you to be pleasant to coworkers, participate in meetings, not roll your eyes or otherwise be dismissive when people talk and be open to discussing areas where I ask you to do something differently and then outline the accountability. I want to be clear that this is important enough that without significant improvement in the next few days, by the way, immediately is okay, we are going to need to move you out of this role. Now, moving them out of the role might be moving them out of the company too. And then finally, Follow through. Terminate them if you need to. Other employees are going to see that and they're going to make sure that they don't act that way. They're not going to say, but, but, but so-and-so got away with it. You need to make sure any kind of rudeness, incivility, drama, gossip, and rumors is squashed. They have no business in business. So get rid of them fast. On the same note, make sure you allow all your employees to share their concerns. So you've removed all the drama from the workplace. You're holding people accountable. Now you need to be open-minded, even though it's going to be time-consuming. Encourage your employees to share their frustrations. And you have to let them know how they share their frustrations. On social media, is probably not appropriate. It may be legal, by the way, but probably not appropriate. But if you're not listening to them, they're going to get attention of somebody else that will listen to them. So this goes back to our first session of listening to people. Let them know that you're interested and concerned by listening and giving them the time, putting them on your calendar, doing the walk around, make sure they know that you care and that you want to hear from them. Another reason you want to allow employees to share their concerns is, guess what? Managers and leaders don't have all the answers. So I ask you, how do your employees share their concerns? 
Do you really think they trust you? Do they come to you? Or do they run to HR or social media? Make sure that when people are coming to you, that you're standing up for them. Make sure that you're protecting your team, not covering up for them. That's two different things. Have you ever worked for somebody who defended you when you made a mistake or for honest reasons, just performed badly on a task? Have you ever stood up for someone? Will you now? I love this quote by Karen Travis, who's an author. If we don't stand up for others, who will be left to stand up for us? When you stand up for your team, you show that you're on their side when they need help, and they're going to come to you instead of burying mistakes. This builds long-term loyalty, trust, that trust factor that we keep talking about. Credibility, your credibility, not the organization's. Commitment to you and your team and positive morale on your team as a whole. And it gives people a confidence boost. It's pretty nice. I have two tips for you for standing up for your team. Tip number one, make sure that you stand up for everyone on your team, not just the team members that you have a good connection with or who might be your favorite employees. And then tip number two, if you defend your people after they make a mistake or perform poorly, which you should be defending them, make sure that the employee does understand what they did wrong. And then there'll be a mutual commitment to not letting it happen again. You may need to sprinkle in there training and development. There may be documentation. There may even be improvement plans. But make sure that you commit to not letting this happen again. Let's move on a little bit more to creating an accountability culture. We've talked about this a lot. Have you ever heard the model SMART or SMARTER? They're SMART goals. This is where you would be setting up your employees for success. Remember I mentioned I'm not a big fan of performance reviews? The reason I don't like performance reviews is they're usually this weird review format that has absolutely nothing to do with the job description or with the goals that the employee has moving forward. They're very generic. If you have job descriptions, which you should, and they should be updated every year, you could quickly just turn that job description into a review format. So for, let's just say there's 10 main major responsibilities, that is your review on those 10 major responsibilities where you say thumbs up employees doing it or thumbs down employees not or whatever your rating system is. Additionally, you can sprinkle in SMART goals. So if you haven't heard about SMART goals, it's an acronym, S-M-A-R-T, and it stands for Specific, Measurable, Action-Oriented, Realistic, and timed. And I do have some handouts. If you're interested, you could just email me or connect with me on LinkedIn and I can get you some formats to make this a lot easier for you. But this is, again, a SMART goal. It sets up people for success for the quarter, for the next six months, for the next year, heck, for the next five, 10 years, if you were going that far. Make sure you do sprinkle in there core values and expected behaviors, not just about performance. The most difficult part of the SMART or the SMARTER goals that I find people struggle with is the measurable part. So making sure that it's very measurable. So whatever goal that somebody wants to do, I want to improve this. How are you going to measure that something is improved, that this skill, this knowledge, this ability has improved? So you have to bring it down to some kind of statistic, a percentage, a number, a head count, whatever it might be. But the measurable is super important. And so when people are starting to go sideways and they look like they don't care anymore, this is when you dust off A, their job description and the SMART goals and say, okay, what's going on here? Is there something going on in your job? Is there something going on in your life? Let's focus on your SMART goals. Or maybe the goals were completely unachievable because, I don't know, a worldwide pandemic hit and the goals went sideways and we forgot to change them for the employees. So make sure, again, they are (laughs) realistic and then timed. Because if you give a goal for 10 years and they don't have to achieve that goal till 10 years, what are you going to talk about in the next three months, six months, nine months, 12 months? So I do encourage you to use SMART goals. It does help employees stay self-motivated. It is also something that you can be talking about in those regular feedback conversations that you're going to now have either every quarter, every month, 
maybe every other month if that's what you need to do. But don't wait until the annual review. It's too late. We did talk a little bit about emotional intelligence as well. So when you're dealing with the whole, oh, my employees don't care, be self-aware. Express your feelings in such a way that you are always aware of the constructive goals, the SMART goals, the performance and behavior feedback, and making sure that your face says, I'm approachable. <laughs> Learn to control your anger and frustration until an appropriate time. Hint, it's never an appropriate time at work. So it's usually maybe, you know, in the car, in the parking lot, maybe when you're jamming out to some tunes and make sure that you're expressing them appropriately and to the appropriate person. You should not be expressing any kind of frustration to them if they're on your team. If you desire to fix problem behaviors in your employees or coworkers, then stooping to their level is not going to get the job done. So grab that mirror and ask yourself, am I part of the problem? So to summarize, five ways employees drive us crazy and what to do about it, they don't listen. They make so many mistakes. They have no common sense. They have entitlement mentality and they just don't care. Really, it's usually the other way around. We need to learn to grab that mirror and see, am I part of the problem? What can I do about that? I have a white paper for free on my website, thehrlady.com, that you can download titled Five Ways Employees Drive Us Crazy. I encourage you to look into it because, dear leader, you might be part of the problem. I have two books which you can find on Amazon or on thehrlady.com.